Hi everyone, hope you're all doing well. My name is Emily Scahill. I'm the Peer Advocacy Supports and Services Associate at Mental Health America's National Office. Welcome to our webinar on ending discrimination on campus. When it comes to mental health, many colleges engage in discriminatory practices that exclude students with psychiatric disabilities from full participation on campus. A recent settlement at Stanford University focused on discriminatory leave of absence policies and advocacy among students themselves are increasing awareness of students' rights and creating pressures on colleges and universities to remove barriers to inclusion. Our presenters today are Monica Porter and Agilsa Fernandez. Monica Porter joined disability rights advocates in 2016 as an Equal Justice Works Fellowship Attorney sponsored by the Ebb Point Foundation, focusing on the rights of California higher education students with psychiatric disabilities. In 2018, she became a staff attorney. Ms. Porter received her JD with honors from the George Washington University in 2016 and her BA with honors from UC Berkeley in 2009. During law school, she interned with the Disability Rights Section of the Department of Justice, Legal Barriers to Employment Project at the Bay Area Legal Aid, and the Disability Rights Program of the Legal Aid Society Employment Law Center. She also clerked for the Honorable Cynthia McKnight at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and worked as a student attorney with GW Law's Public Justice Advocacy Clinic, for which she was awarded GW Law's Community Legal Clinic's Volunteer Service Award. Agilsa Fernandez has worked on governmental policy, research, and public communications in relation to disability. Agilsa's personal experience with disabilities informs and inspires her activism for disability rights. She graduated magna cum laude from Stony Brook University in December 2018 with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, despite being told she would never be able to attend school because of her struggles with psychosis. Some notes before we get started, at the top of your screen in the gray start meeting box, there's a chat bubble, which you can click on to open up a messaging window. So feel free to drop any questions in there and we'll do a Q&A at the end. Um, and we'll also re be recording this webinar and sending that out along with the slides afterwards. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Monica to get us started. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm happy to join you to talk to you about uh, students' rights in the context of campus mental health. As Emily said, my name is Monica Porter. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a staff attorney at Disability Rights Advocates. DRA is a national nonprofit legal organization that focuses on advocating on behalf of people with disabilities in high impact cases to bring about systemic change. A quick note on language. Today I'll use the term mental health disability rather than terms such as mental illness or mental health condition. At DRA, we use the term mental health disability in reference to conditions such as anxiety, depression, and PTSD to make clear that individuals who have these conditions are part of the disability community and especially for our purposes today, are covered under the same laws that protect people with other types of disabilities such as learning and physical disabilities. Today's focus is on mental health disabilities and higher education. This issue, as many of you know, is widespread. Nationwide, one in five uh, higher education students live with a mental health disability. Suicide is the second leading cause of death, and half of students who drop out did so because of a mental health disability. In the third case, many of whom who dis dropped out did so because and did not disclose their disability because they were afraid of stigma or did not know that they could receive an accommodation if they were to disclose. There are a number of federal laws that protect people with disabilities. First and foremost, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Second, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which we'll not cover in detail today because it provides generally the same protections as the ADA. We'll also talk about the Fair Housing Act, which applies to campus-owned uh, housing. And in slightly less detail, uh, federal laws such as FERPA and HIPAA, which are relevant for privacy and record keeping. 
And then finally, I'll cover as a case study Stanford University, which we had a case uh, with them regarding their leave of absence policies and practices. We'll start with the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. The ADA is the civil rights law for people with disabilities, and it's the product of the disability rights and independent living movement pictured here on your slide. Before laying out its protections, the ADA provides context in a section called Findings and Purposes. In this preamble, Congress recognized that people with that mental health disabilities in no way diminish a person's right to fully participate in all aspects of society, that historically society has tended to isolate and segregate individuals with disabilities, and that discrimination against individuals with disabilities persists in such critical areas as education. The purpose of the ADA is to provide a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities. The first issue in ADA analysis is whether the individual is covered by the act. The ADA is unique among civil rights laws in a few ways we'll cover today. The first is that an individual has to demonstrate membership in the protected class. Here, the ADA defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Major life activities include, but are not limited to, learning, concentrating, thinking, and caring for oneself. There is additional federal guidance that provides that mental health conditions like major depression, PTSD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and obsessive compulsive disorder should easily qualify. An individual also has to demonstrate that they are a qualified individual with a disability which is defined as an individual who, with or without reasonable modifications, meets the essential eligibility requirements to receive services or participate in programs. I'll pause here because it's an important note. An individual with a disability who receives reasonable accommodations is still qualified. Under the ADA, no qualified individual with a disability may be excluded from participation, denied benefits, or discriminated in any way in the execution of services, programs, or activities. Examples of what could be discriminatory include using a policy that tends to screen out people with disabilities, failing to administer programs in the most integrated setting appropriate, or imposing a surcharge on a person with a disability for the cost of accommodations. And we'll cover those in a bit more detail. Discrimination also includes failure to make reasonable modifications to policies, practices, or procedures when modifications are necessary to avoid discrimination, unless the entity can demonstrate that making that modification would fundamentally alter the service, program, or activity. This is another way in which the Americans with Disabilities Act can be unique among civil rights laws. In certain contexts with protected classes, avoiding discrimination means treating various communities the same. In the disability context, it often requires an affirmative step or treating people with disabilities differently. One example is if a student is blind, providing a textbook in Braille or an electronic version would be an exception to the general rule of providing materials in printed text. Similarly, uh, if a student has a mental health disability and requires the use of a service or emotional support animal, allowing service or emotional support animal in the dorms would be an exception to a general rule against having pets. 
Another way that the ADA is unique is that oftentimes individuals need to start the accommodation conversation. That's especially true if someone has what's called an invisible disability, like a mental health disability, where it's not immediately apparent that the person is a member of this protected class. I want to pause to acknowledge that this is burdensome, especially when someone's going through a hard time, but there is a requirement to put the school on notice. You'll notice in the second half of the slide that this rule balances out in that discrimination is a failure to provide a reasonable modification unless that modification would be a fundamental alteration. Once a student has put the school on notice that they have a disability and a need for an accommodation, then the school has an opportunity to respond and engage in that interactive process. There are three specific defenses that we will look at today. Uh, the first is, and we mentioned it already, fundamental alteration. The second is undue burden. And the third is direct threat. And I'll address each of those in more detail. The first is fundamental alteration, which is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. To use an illustrative example, it would not be a fundamental alteration to provide a student with extra time on a test when that test is meant to test subject mastery as opposed to reading or processing speed. In contrast, it might be a fundamental alteration if a student has a chemical sensitivity in a chemistry lab such that they can't be in the same room as the chemicals that are a necessary part of that instruction. As a general rule of thumb, if it would require modifying a policy that's peripheral to an entity's program or service, it would probably not be a fundamental alteration to change it. However, if it is a fundamental alteration, schools are not required to, for example, provide new programs or new curricula. The second defense we'll cover today is undue burden. Again, this is determined on a case-by-case -case basis and is particularly mindful of, in this instance, a school's financial and administrative resources. Again, to provide an illustrative example, it would probably not be an undue burden for a school to provide a lab aid or a note taker to assist a student during class. It might be an undue burden for a school to provide, for example, a personal aid to assist a student with bathing or dressing or getting to or from school. Another classic example outside of the school context, you wouldn't require a mom and pop store to install an elevator uh, in order to provide access to people with mobility disabilities, but you might require them to make sure that the aisles are wide enough that a wheelchair can navigate around the store. The third defense that we'll cover today is direct threat. And here's where it gets particularly tricky. Entities may impose legitimate safety requirements that are necessary for the safe operation of services, programs, or activities. This means that entities are not required to permit someone to participate if they pose a direct threat. Direct threat is defined as a significant risk to health or safety of others that cannot be eliminated by a reasonable modification. However, those safety requirements must be based on actual risk and not on mere speculation or stereotypes. So in determining whether someone poses a direct threat, there must be an individualized assessment based on current objective medical knowledge regarding the nature, duration, severity, likelihood of risk, and whether modification would mitigate that risk. In sum, if after proper individualized assessment it is determined that an individual poses a threat to the health or safety of others, they can be legally excluded from a space. Turning to 
if there's an instance of direct threat to self, which is even less clear. In the employment context, the Supreme Court has held that threat to self is sufficient to exclude someone from a space. In the school context, it is unclear. The text, is, the text of the rule only notes threat to others and does not support discrimination against someone who poses a threat only to themselves. Unfortunately, with the case law, it gets murky, especially in the context of higher education. So it is unclear whether schools can exclude someone from campus or dormitories if they pose a threat to self. What is clear is that the determination must be based on an individualized assessment based on current medical knowledge. We'll turn now from the Americans with Disabilities Act to applying this in the context of housing and looking at the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act is a federal law that prohibits discrimination in the terms, conditions, sale, or rental of housing on the basis of race, religion, sex, disability, familial status, or national origin. In the context of higher education, residence halls and dorm rooms are covered. Students cannot be banned from the dorms based on a mental health disability. Discrimination includes that sort of exclusion and failure to allow reasonable accommodation. In the context of the Fair Housing Act, the direct threat, direct threat defense only applies to threat to others, not threat to self. And as with the ADA, the direct threat assessment must be individualized and based on objective evidence. We'll talk a little bit more now about reasonable accommodations in the context of housing. Discrimination under the Fair Housing Act includes refusal to make reasonable accommodations in policies or practices when they might be necessary to afford someone an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling, which we've discussed dwelling does include campus-owned housing. To take us through the Fair Housing Act process a bit quicker than the ADA process, a resident or applicant for housing should begin that process by disclosing that they have a disability and are requesting a reasonable modification. You'll recall again that the landlord does need to be put on notice. Once the landlord has been put on notice, it creates an affirmative duty on landlords to engage in the interactive process to identify a reasonable accommodation for the tenant. As usual, this should be a fact-specific and individualized inquiry. You'll recall the defenses that we covered in the context of the Americans with Disabilities Act. An accommodation might not be reasonable if it were to impose a fundamental alteration in the nature of the program, if it would cause an undue or financial, undue financial or administrative burden, or if it would pose a direct threat. A bit more detail on the last two. Undue burden does not mean that it would pose no cost. Landlords may have to shoulder certain costs so long as they are not unduly burdensome. And finally, with respect to direct threat, that assessment may be applied to a tenant themselves or in the instance of a tenant requiring a service or emotional support animal, that animal does need to be deemed to not pose a direct threat to others as well. To talk a little bit more about those individual accommodations, accommodations may include something like reassignment to a different room or a single room or a different dormitory. Emotional support animals and service animals is something that we receive a lot of calls about at DRA, so I'll touch on that for a minute. It may be an exception to a no pets rule where a person with a disability has a disability-related need for an emotional support animal, 
that alleviates one or more symptoms or effects of their disability. For example, an individual who experiences anxiety might have uh, an animal who by their mere presence helps to alleviate those symptoms in the context of an emotional support animal or in the context of a service animal may be trained to recognize and respond to aggravation of symptoms by, for example, applying pressure therapy or reminding an individual to take medication. Once an individual makes a request for a reasonable accommodation, the landlord has to engage in an individualized assessment. That assessment can ask two questions of the individual. One, whether the tenant has a disability, and two, whether the tenant has a disability-related need for an emotional support or service animal. Landlords are permitted to request documentation of those two questions. So tenants may have to provide a doctor's note, for example, stating that the animal provides emotional support or otherwise alleviates one or more symptoms of, or effects of the tenant's disability. However, landlords may not ask for things in excess of that, such as access to medical records or speaking directly with medical providers or asking for detailed, extensive information or documentation about someone's diagnosis, medications, what have you. To apply these laws directly to college campuses, these are the types of issues that tend to come up in a few common situations. Uh, the ADA and the Fair Housing Act may come into play with respect to leave of absence policies, be those voluntary or involuntary leaves. In the context of, and I apologize, it looks like it's cut off for housing um, with emotional support or service animals or with eviction or exclusion from housing. It may also come into play with accommodations which could be applied in academics or in housing or in administrative. To briefly provide an example of an administrative accommodation, if, for example, a student is taking a medication that makes them drowsy in the morning and they need their classes to be in the afternoons and evenings, the student could request an administrative accommodation for advanced registration so that they can get classes that work for their schedule. Remember that it is on the student to alert their school to their disability and need for accommodation and put the school on notice to engage in that interactive process and then it is the school's duty to so engage. And keep in mind that these laws could impact students uh, in the academic context as well as an employee. Many students work in the residence halls, the dining halls, student store, grad students who teach, and of course faculty and staff members. And so all of these laws do apply in the employment context as well. There are two privacy laws in higher education. I want to be mindful of the time. I know that these resources are going to be sent out, so I am going to skip over these as I don't work with them as closely. But I'll note that each of these slides has links to additional information with respect to FERPA, which covers uh, education records, and then HIPAA, which covers medical records which takes us to the case study of Stanford University. This is a case that I worked on regarding Stanford's leave of absence policies and practices. We found after speaking with students that Stanford had a policy and practice of excluding students from campus and housing in the event of a mental health crisis. We filed this case in May of 2018 with the Mental Health and Wellness Coalition, which is a coalition of students, and three individual plaintiffs. After we filed, the phone started ringing and we heard from additional students who had similar experiences. And in July of 2018, we amended the complaint to add three additional plaintiffs and four additional witnesses. <clears throat> 
Thankfully, shortly thereafter, we engaged in productive settlement negotiations, and I'm very happy to share with you what the result of that advocacy has been. To tie together and apply the different laws that we've been talking about so far today, the claims that we included in the lawsuit were the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, specifically Title III, which applies to private entities, in this instance, private colleges and universities. In the instance of public colleges and universities, Title II applies, and the language of each is very similar. We also invoked Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the Fair Housing Act as it applied to campus-owned housing. I'll also note that in California and in many other states, there are corollary laws that provide similar and in some instances additional protections. And so I'll note that um, individuals who want to be more aware of their rights in their specific state will want to look for state-based corollaries to these federal laws. I'm very happy to tell you that in October of this year, uh, the parties reached a comprehensive settlement agreement. That settlement agreement includes a rewritten involuntary leave of absence and return policy. Under that policy, involuntary leave of absence is a last resort only after mandatory consultation with a representative from Stanford's Disability Services Office who has expertise in mental health disabilities to determine if there are reasonable accommodations that would permit the student to remain at school without taking a leave. Stanford will also give significant weight to the opinion of the student's treatment providers regarding the need for a leave. The settlement also provides for a more transparent process for students. The notice requirements have now included reasons for the leave of absence, a time frame of next steps, a copy of the rewritten policy explaining all leave-related procedures, including appeal, return, and students' rights to reasonable accommodations throughout these processes, contact information for resources at the university that may assist students throughout the process, and an anticipated timeline for return determined on an individualized basis. Students now have access to housing during leave, which brings students with mental health disabilities into parity with students with other medical disabilities. And finally, when a student wishes to return, Stanford's assessment will be whether the student is ready and able to return to Stanford with or without reasonable accommodations and students may express their readiness to return to Stanford in their own words, but they are no longer required to submit a personal statement as in the past. There is a settlement agreement which is available on Disability Rights Advocates website that extends past the rewritten policy and provides for a number of important points. The first is that voluntary leaves of absence, which I've noted here as VLOA, will be truly voluntary. In the event that a student signs a voluntary leave of absence form and does not want to take a voluntary leave of absence, they will have two business days to revoke their consent. And the voluntary leave of absence form will be amended to include information on how to revoke that consent. Another important point is that there will be increased staffing and staff training to answer students' questions about involuntary leave and return policies, and additional staff with expertise in working with students with mental health disabilities and reasonable accommodations that may allow students to avoid taking a leave. The annual staff training will be regarding the rewritten involuntary leave and return policy and procedures, and it will also cover Stanford's obligations to students with mental health disabilities under federal and state disability rights laws. The final two points I'll cover today. Stanford has registered for JED Campus, which is a four-year partnership with the JED Foundation to develop policies and programs that create positive systemic change in the campus community 
regarding student mental health, substance abuse, and suicide prevention efforts. And over the course of the next two years, disability rights advocates will monitor Stanford's implementation of the changes that we've agreed to, and the court will retain jurisdiction for purposes of enforcement to the extent that that is necessary. To wrap up today, and before I turn it over to Ajilsa, I'll note that because of the ways in which disability rights laws are unique and the ways in which achieving equity can be burdensome for students with mental health disabilities, it is especially important that we as friends and community members and advocates get the message out about accommodations that are available, foster a community in which students feel comfortable asking for help, and our allies for students in their efforts to succeed on campus and achieve positive change. Conversations like these are important ways to bring down the dropout rate, reduce stigma, and better enable students with mental health disabilities to succeed. And that's what this work is all about. I'll thank Mental Health America again for having me be a part of this panel, and I'm very happy to now turn it over to Ajilsa. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Sajilsa. I use any pronouns and I am the founder of Peer Mental Health Alliance. Next slide. I founded Peer Mental Health Alliance in spring 2017. Next slide. I had noticed that stigma was a barrier to obtaining information and resources on campus. So one of the things that we did via this organization was that we went outside the box. We attended events where people normally wouldn't expect us, such as baseball games, basketball games, carnivals, and dance marathon. We began to normalize speaking about mental health openly in diverse spaces. Next slide. Here is a photo where we held a, a march around campus and raised awareness. Next slide. Due to this outreach, more students became aware of Peer Mental Health Alliance and became more comfortable seeking out help, resources, and information in regards to mental health. In fall 2018, a student messaged me. According to them, Upon arriving to their dorm after being hospitalized for an overdose for a few days, a resident hall assistant, known as an RA, had told the student that they were not allowed back into their dorm. The student was told that they must leave the school premises immediately and was given a letter stating that they were restricted from entering all academic and residential buildings and their surrounding areas. Basically, they were being punished for their illness. At least this is how students see it. According to the student, when they, when they asked where they should go, they were told to go to a nearby hotel. When the student said they couldn't afford going there, they were given resources to a shelter whose beds were full. Allegedly, a police officer successfully advocated for the student and the school found another dorm to place the student in while they figured out a more permanent solution. Had it not been for this officer, the student could have most likely ended up sleeping in the streets. Next slide. Knowing this, it bothered me so much that I began researching on this issue. This is when I found out that several universities had a similar problem where students were forced out of campus rather than being provided proper accommodations. The policy that created these issues, I learned, was called the medical leave policies. Many of these schools have been sued or were in the process of being sued. Stanford University was a recent case where students had filed a lawsuit. Next slide. Here's another picture of that. Stanford case written by New York Times. No, I'm um, sorry. Yale University also had been sued 
Next slide. As well as Hunter College and George Washington. This is to name a few. This is when I decided to reach out to Monica Porter, who was mentioned in the Sanford case. Unfortunately, we couldn't file a case for students in Stony Brook University due to reasons I cannot disclose publicly. But what I found was countless of other students who had similar experience with a forced leave due to the medical leave policy. Many of these students claim that they ended up homeless, sleeping in sleeping bag in someone else's dorm, or had to return home suddenly. This is a huge problem. What I found via research, the research that I did in Stony Brook University, was that the medical leave policies was creating homelessness. According to students, they ended up homeless once they were forced to take the medical leave because they didn't know where else to go. They had invested in their campus storm, and for various reasons, parents moved out without them, they had been living on their own prior, or they were foster children before, they didn't have a home to return to. The schools did little to nothing, according to the students, to connect them to resources, and therefore they ended up homeless. Other students couldn't return to their homes because their family members were being abusive. It is the reason why they had left home and lived in a dorm to begin with. The abuse most reported were sexual and physical abuse. And lastly, Students who were of low income or poor couldn't suddenly return to their homes because there wasn't enough food or it would create an unsafe living space with too many people crammed up into an apartment. This is another reason why they had to leave, where they, why they had decided to live on campus rather than commute from their homes. Next slide. In my research, I also found that the communities that were highly affected by these policies were BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color, LGBTQA+, people who identify as women, and people with disabilities. This makes sense because if you think about it, many students who identify as LGBTQA are shunned by their families and or abuse. So once they take the medical leave suddenly, they are more likely to find themselves without a home. Women and by POC make less money, so they are more likely to not be able to afford a place so suddenly. And people with disabilities have barriers in obtaining a place in general due to accessibility and income, as this population also has a high risk of poverty. Imagine having to move suddenly. The risk of homelessness is high for marginalized communities who are forced to take a medical leave after a mental health crisis on campus. Next slide. I further found that the medical leave policies on Stony Brook University were not the only issues for students. Here, you see a broken ADA button. There are countless of students with physical disabilities that rely on a functioning ADA button in order to move around campus. This is important for students seeking mental health counseling. What happens if the doors to the psychological department doesn't open? This creates a barrier to healthcare. Next slide. Events in Stony Brook University also didn't have appropriate announcements in regards to accommodation. Many people with psychological disabilities or a mental health diagnose, as not everyone identifies with the word disability, requires accommodations. This can be a quiet room during an event, headphones or earplugs to reduce noise or sounds, or being in an area that is less crowded. For students who have both a physical and a mental health diagnose, they may need a ramp, accessible seats, etc. Not disclosing who to contact for accommodations creates barriers for students and excludes them from activities. This creates an environment that isn't inclusive and welcoming for all. Next slide. We found other ADA, Ameri the American for Disability Act related issues in Stony Brook 
such as the elevators leading up to the psychological department, not operating for weeks. And the therapist didn't designate another area to meet with students who relied on the elevators. Given the various reasons, we couldn't, get, we couldn't file a lawsuit. What we, the students, decided to do was address the issue with the administrators in a meeting. Unfortunately, the first few meetings, the administrations had denied that there were any problems on campus in relation to disabilities. So we created a student-led group to explore ideas on how we could best address these issues. Next slide. One of the actions we decided to take was to inform the students of their legal rights. We used the DRAs, the Disability Rights Association, Know Your Rights pamphlet. Many students knew that being forced off campus felt wrong, but they didn't know their legal rights. One of the things I found during my research in Stony Brook University was that students didn't identify with, that many students didn't identify with the words disability. This creates a barrier in knowing their legal rights as the ADA and other laws because these laws are under the word disability. Since most students with a mental health diagnosis do not identify with the word disability, they didn't know what resources, accommodations, or legal rights they were afforded. Next slide. Another action we took was writing op-eds. This helped erase awareness and inform the public about these issues. Next slide. Lastly, we decided to protest and march around the campus in order to further raise awareness on these issues. Next slide. Here is another photo of that march. During the protest, we also, had, we also handed the administrators a list of things that should change within the school. Next slide. After the protest, administrators were more willing to listen and accept that changes needed to occur. Our undergraduate student government, also known as USG, was highly supportive and facilitated the discussion with administrators. Next slide. We also had the help and support of campus newspapers, like the statement, next slide, and other campus newspaper as seen here. Next slide. The local news also wrote about, this, about these issues. Thanks to all of these collaborations, we were able to see effective and positive changes. Next slide. The ADA buttons were fixed. Workers were mandated to report daily on the, all ADA buttons across the campus. And all of the televisions on campus displayed where students could report the broken or non-functioning ADA buttons. The events also added accommodations announcement and who people can contact in case they needed accommodations. Not just major events, but all events. This means even the events that were hosted by student organizations and clubs. Next slide. All of the leaders of students' clubs and organizations were also trained on disabilities, accommodations, and inclusion. And they were required to submit events that followed the ADA guidelines. This further created a more welcoming and inclusive campus for all. Next slide. Well, there has been amazing and positive changes in Stony Brook University without filing a lawsuit. Unfortunately, we still continue to fight for changes in regards to the medical leave policy. Currently, Stony Brook University has created an ADA committee where countless of students gave feedback on this matter. As of September 2019, there were discussions to add two new case manager roles to connect with community resources, especially in the case of off-campus housing options, and to appoint a mental health liaison to help students find treatments, coordinate care, and receive accommodations. 
students continue to advocate and push for change in this area. Whether Stony Brook University will make the proper changes without a lawsuit is something we await to see. Next slide. Finally, I strongly believe that students should come together to advocate for permanent and lasting changes in these policies. The medical leave issue is a national crisis taking place in countless of universities. Currently, universities are being sued one by one, and millions of dollars are being spent in these losses. Imagine what can happen if instead that money was invested in student accommodations and services. Perhaps it's going to take student advocacy and activism to work alongside lawyers and policymakers to create a permanent change to the medical leave policies. Thank you, Mental Health America, for having me. Thank you guys so much for sharing your experience and ideas. Um, we don't have any questions right now, but for anyone who is on and watching, um, like I said, that chat bubble up at the top in that gray start meeting box. Um, feel free to pop your questions in there, um, and we can ask those. We can hang on for a few minutes and see if any of those come in, if that sounds good to you guys. Sure. Or if you have any last words, feel free to say those as well. I see a question. Yes. So how can other students utilize the ADA to ensure that their colleges comply with the law? Jessa, would you like to start or would you like me to jump in? You can start. Sure. Um, this is Monica. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, I think there are a number of ways to engage on an individual and a systemic level. Um, I know that many schools have allies who can help with these conversations. Um, Students, uh, the school's disability services offices are often well versed on the sorts of accommodations that students are entitled to. Adjilsa made a great point regarding many students with mental health uh, diagnoses not realizing that they are entitled to these sorts of accommodations. So this multifaceted approach of informing students of their rights and that they are entitled to these uh, accommodations is critical, and then engaging with universities about how to apply them in various settings is also really helpful. Um, I'll note that we do have additional information available online. Disability Rights Advocates website is dralegal.org, O-R-G. If you go to DRA's website, dralegal.org slash campus mental health, we do have the Know Your Rights brochure that Adjilsa referred to. We also have an active online form where students can reach out to us individually, and we're happy to provide individualized feedback. This is Adjilsa. I second that. I think it's um, essential for students to become aware of their legal rights. And one of the ways that we were able to inform other students in Stony Brook University was by using that pamphlet that Monica mentioned. And that was critical because a lot of students don't identify with the word disability. They'll talk about mental health diagnosis, psychiatric survivor, uh, and a bunch of other things, but disability is usually the last thing that many students identify with. So they don't really know that they're afforded these rights. So I think that that's critical to first um, make people aware of the legal rights. And then you can not only go to the disability office in your campus, but you can also find the deans of students to be of a wonderful resource. They usually help students connect with their rights and help advocate with them for whatever accommodations they may need. 
and also the psychological department. So you can ask them for letters that needs to be written up for accommodations or if you need to talk about some of these rights, they're a really good resource. Great. So another question. Can a school require a student to provide psychological records when determining leave of absence, or should it be based on the assessment of the campus mental health staff? This is Monica. That's a really good question, and, and the amount of disclosure required in the interactive process is, is complicated. Um, I'd be happy to address those questions offline if a student wanted to reach out through our form. I'll also note that um, the way that we resolved that with Stanford was that students had the option to provide effectively as much or as little documentation, um, and Stanford would proceed based on the information that they had available. Um, and so if a student wanted to uh, control how much was disclosed, that that is an option. Um, we also noted that with whatever amount of information is provided, um, that Stanford will give significant weight to the student's treatment provider. That was specifically in response to one of our client's experiences wherein he, his treatment provider recommended he return to campus and he was placed on involuntary leave. And so it's helpful to, for students to have conversations with their mental health providers about um, providing documentation if a student wishes to remain on campus and the student's treatment team feels that that's in the student's best interest. There are a number of resources out there that provide uh, sample letters or additional guidance in terms of how much a treatment provider might want to provide in that sort of documentation. Additional resources in addition to disability rights advocates are the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law and Policy. They have an excellent Know Your Rights pamphlet. Also, um, as a Jill said, and I've touched on many students with mental health conditions don't identify with the term disability. However, there are a number of resources available through the disability rights community. Each state in the United States has what's called a protection and advocacy agency. Oftentimes that the formula of the name is disability rights and the name of the state. In California, it's called Disability Rights California. However, in Illinois, for example, it's called Equip for Equality. If a student effectively Googles uh, protection and advocacy agency and the name of their state, there will be additional information, hopefully, um, that can guide the student through these sorts of accommodations processes, and they might have sample letters as well to provide an idea of how much to disclose or how to disclose it. Great. So another question. If we are committed to bringing legal action against a university for failing to comply with ADA, where would we begin that action? So there are, this is Monica again, there are a number of options for advocacy. Um, Ajelsa really helps, uh, did a really great job of outlining informal ways, uh, and not really informal, that's the wrong word, but ways to do that outside of the legal process, which can often be quite effective. There are a couple of different options to use the courts or some other legal process. Uh, a federal agency that is applicable here is the Office for Civil Rights through the Federal Department of Education. Um, if it's a housing issue, there might be additionally a state-based um, housing or education entity through which a student could file an administrative complaint to try to resolve the issue in that way. Um, and then there is the option to file a private lawsuit. There are a number of uh, private attorneys that work in this space, in addition to nonprofits such as DRA and Bazelon Center that would be available to assist. Um, again, uh, our website is dralegal.org. 
slash campus mental health. And we do have an online form if an individual student would like to um, reach out and we can provide some more localized referrals. And um, the last thing I'll say on that piece is that those protection and advocacy agencies that I mentioned that are state by state are also staffed with lawyers and they do often bring these sorts of cases. And so if cost is a concern and a student wants to explore nonprofit routes, uh, those are the ones that we would recommend starting with. Um, and then there are sliding scale and contingency fee based private attorneys who could also assist. This is Achilsa. I would just like to add to that that if you're filing and you're looking for free resources to file, like uh, con um, sorry, on a sliding scale or a free lawyer, that it might be more challenging if you're the only student. Normally, a class action lawsuit—it's what takes place when it's for free or with an, a nonprofit. At least that was some of the barriers that we faced. Okay, and another question. Is there a supervisory body that holds private college counseling centers accountable for malpractice? This is Monica. I think that that would go more towards um, the federal agencies that we mentioned, specifically the uh, Office for Civil Rights. Um, malpractice is a very specific term, but effectively, if, if there, the question is, if, is there a supervisory body to hold colleges accountable for complying with these laws, uh, the Office for Civil Rights would be a place to start. And are colleges and universities legally allowed to turn away a student who is seeking on-campus counseling services from the counseling center? This is Monica. I think that that goes to the discussion we were having earlier about qualified individual with a disability. Um, a student, without speaking specifically to an instance, I can say that uh, these protections do apply both to enrolled students and to applicants, and that the accommodations and assessments that we talked about are all really case by case, and that there are flags with potential legal issues where there is an instance of a blanket policy of exclusion. And so students, even in the application process, are entitled to reasonable accommodations. And if there is an instance of blanket exclusion without an individualized assessment, then that could cause, uh, be cause for concern. So that's all we have right now for general questions. There are a few um, specific questions that people put into that chat box, but it sounds like the better place to to take that is that form that you mentioned, Monica. Would would you say so? Yes, certainly. Okay, great. And I'll include that link um, when I send out the recording and slides to everyone later this week. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, um, we can end a bit early today. Oh, we got one more. Um, Ajilsa, could you talk about how you started activism? So I started in spring 2017 because I noticed that stigma was a barrier for students to get um, resources. So a lot of the other organizations that I was noticing, they had the tables in places where they were expecting the people to come up. But if stigma is a barrier, a lot of people are not going to come up to the table. So what Peter Mental Health Alliance did is that we went up to people. We had, like, games, activities. We made it fun and exciting. And that's how pretty much I, I got started. I got started with just creating events on campus, thinking outside the box. And then once I heard about students facing this particular issue with the medical leave policies, that's how I got into activism. 
which was to create the protest, to write up the letters to administrators, and then just getting a bunch of students with, who are like-minded to join forces and speak about these issues. So I would say take notice of things that you want to change on your campus and don't wait for someone else to be the change. You can be that change. Notice where you want to serve and what difference you want to bring and then just start. How did you go about finding other students with shared experiences? The same way, because we had already started the Peer Mental Health Alliance, and it was up and running for a year or so before we, we knew about this case. So it was easier to send uh, emails, and we had a group going on already, so it was easier to communicate through social media and through emails and get more people, you know, ask them, who wants to join? Who wants to come to the meetings? And then join forces with other people. But if you don't have that group and you want to get started on activism, I would suggest creating a Facebook group and then asking other students to join. Sharing it in your classroom or asking the professors if you, if you can get like a minute or two in the beginning of the class to share that group or hand out flyers where people can meet you. Um, normally, in a lot of the campuses, you can, you can, com um, sorry, you can meet up as a group in different spaces, so long as it's not academic spaces. So you can meet, like, in a cafeteria or in, a, in the grass. These public spaces is open for a meeting for free without you even having to register an organization. And I think that that's a great way to get started. Great. Well, that seems like it in the, in the chat box, but thank you both so much for sharing your ideas and thoughts today and for the work you do. Um, this has been great. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great rest of your day, um, and I will send out the recording and resources and slides shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.